Thank you both so much for joining us today. Representative Moyle, you're a co-sponsor on House Bill 199. Why, in your view, is this the best path forward for tax relief this year? Well, because it cut income tax rates and it lowered the overall sales tax rate. And, and it accomplished what we wanted to accomplish was we get the talk going about tax relief. We're sitting on a lot of money and there's no reason we're not getting a bunch of it back to the taxpayer. I don't know that House Bill 199 is the total answer, but at least it got the ball rolling. And now you're hearing a lot of other proposals come forward because of it. And, there, and I don't know where we're going to end up in the end, but it, get, it gets the talk going. Can you give us some insight into how those talks are going? What are you hearing from other members of your caucus? Other members of our caucus are on all different places from the sales tax to the income tax to the property tax. All three of them have been talked about. A lot of the discussion has been between the House, Senate, and Governor as we try to find a proposal going forward that can address the, the tax relief issue at the same time address the concerns with roads. So they're kind of tied together now in their mind. So now there's this back and forth to try to find a place where everybody can agree that they're happy with. You know, this specific version of the proposal, critics have pointed to the disparities in income tax relief for the top percent of earners uh, versus the lower 60 percent of households, which would get less than $100 in income tax relief. So can you talk to me about that disparity? Are people who are struggling the most in this economy going to benefit from a proposal like this? When we get done, whatever comes from the legislature will we'll address that bottom end. The problem you have, though, is the percentage of tax relief in that bill is higher on the bottom than the top. But in Idaho, since the rich start at 7500 bucks, so to give you an example, if you make 11900 and some change, you're in the higher bracket. And that makes it really tough since so many people are at the top end of the bracket than the bottom end of the bracket. But whatever we do will address that concern. The end result the end bill that comes out of here will take care of that concern. And like I said, House Bill 199 got the ball rolling. We're now talking. We now know the places we need to move around to fix that issue on the bottom to make sure we take care of our friends on that end of the scale, too. And, the, and what we pass will do that. Uh, Representative Blinksma, I want to bring you into the conversation. What are you hearing from other House Republicans, um, their ideas as far as tax relief this session? Yeah, I think there is a, a big interest in providing income tax relief and transportation. And there's also, we can't forget the one-time money that's also available. So when you, you talk to some of those folks that are falling um, lower on the income tax brackets, we should have the opportunity to provide them some direct relief with the one-time monies that we have available to us. So I do know that right now the transportation chairman of the House and uh, the the T Revit tax chairman are working together to try to find a larger package so that, that we can help with uh, transportation and provide income tax relief and also look at that one-time money to provide one-time tax relief rebate style. So it's they're looking at quite a few different options. I know that we're working probably with the Senate as as best as we ever had. And, and so there's a good working relationship there between all the chairmen and I, I'm hopeful that we get something soon to put out to the public because I think that I completely agree with uh, Representative Moyle that 199 is a good starting place, but we've made a lot of progress since that was put out to the public. And I, I think I look forward to seeing what's coming. You say soon, any idea about when we might see that uh, next proposal or final proposal? I talked to the chairman this morning and I said it would be really lovely if we could see something next week. So that, that's my hope and um, obviously as part of my role, I, I will be trying to get it out to the public and, so that they can see what it does for them. Representative Moyle, you're also a co-sponsor on Senate Bill 1108, the property tax proposal. Um, you know, we, we spoke to Senator Rice earlier in the show about that specific proposal. So not getting into too many details, there's been a lot of criticism from local government officials saying that there seems to be a fundamental misunderstanding from lawmakers about how these local budgets are put together. Um, it, you've been involved in putting together tax policy for years now. Um, but I wanted you to respond to that. Is there a fundamental misunderstanding between the legislature and these locals? No, I don't think there's a misunderstanding at all, other than the fact that they want to spend more and they need to slow down in their spending. It's what's driving up property taxes. We can talk about values and assessments and all those different things, but ultimately it ties to their budgets. And the fact that they're concerned about that bill is concerning to me because that bill just slows down the growth. It's fundamentally wrong that a mayor can sit on the TV this morning, how I'm talking about this morning, and say that 
new growth is okay, even though it raises somebody who's lived there 50 years as property taxes. It's not okay to raise their property taxes, and we need to slow down that, that, that. We need to slow down property taxes. It's one of the number one issues. And, I, and it can be done if they will come to the table. This is the part that really bothers me. You know, we've asked them for years and years. You saw last year, I got the freeze bill to the Senate. They amended it with the locals input to a 4%, then they killed it. This year, we worked with them with an interim committee. They were all okay till the bill got here. The counties are all okay, but the cities aren't. And it's fundamentally does not really do that much to them. It just slows down the growth of their budget and prevents the shift to the existing property taxpayers. What's wrong with that? It's not gonna hurt them that bad. Well, and I think, you know, I think Melissa, if I may, um, I, we're also trying to be um, sensitive to other counties, right? This is, this is primarily a Treasure Valley problem at this point because the growth has been so substantial here. And so when you, you're starting to turn those dials on what you can do to help fix the property tax situation here in the Treasure Valley, you want to make sure that you don't harm some other areas of the state that aren't experiencing the same type of growth that you're experiencing here. And remember, that bill ties only with growth. And it's not just Treasure Valley. It's Twin Falls. It's Idaho Falls. It's Pocatello. It's Coeur d'Alene. It's all over the state. But that bill, just it does not hurt in, you know 85% of the taxing districts where they don't have a growth problem. So Megan's right. A bunch of the state doesn't have a problem. That bill doesn't affect them. What's going on with the cities, in my opinion, now is nothing more than scare tactics. Uh, Megan's done a really good job and made a... a um, 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 diagram where you can punch in your numbers and you can see what's coming out and and she's done a really good job with that and hopefully next week we can make that available to all the senators and house members so they can really see is this propaganda being put forward by the cities true or are they wrong and how it really does affect them you know you, you say it's it's propaganda and scare tactics from Absolutely. these mayors but your Absolutely. own your own mayor your own mayor, the mayor of Star, is one of the people who's saying, you know, a one size fits all solution like what's being proposed in 1108 is going to hurt Star moving forward. Um, so you, you're hurt saying Star. that it just slows down his ability to raise everybody's taxes. I mean, uh, the, the concept that this is somehow going to end is, is wrong. And the fact that these cities are now saying they're going to stop development if we pass this bill, good. A lot of us would like to see it slowed down. The cities, you know, I hate it when they come out and say things that aren't true, and it's not true. It slows down the growth. It's not a big property tax relief bill. It's level. It's not, it's not what they set, they're selling it to be because they're concerned they may lose $5. It's wrong. What they're doing is wrong. And if they don't like it, tell them to bring a proposal. We've asked them for a proposal for three years now, and all they do is do exactly what they're doing this year. We get a bill, they run over and try to kill it. It's wrong. They it's said not. that they've brought proposals in the Senate or the, the working group didn't want to consider that revisiting home homeowners exemption the circuit breaker impact fees the, those they, are all things that they, they have brought, brought to the table that proposals they that did before. nothing more than shift the tax to somebody else and shifting the tax does not solve the problem when you're in a city like star when 97 percent of the value is homes there's nobody to shift it to their taxes aren't going down when you raise the homeowners exemption because there's no business to shift it to and they know that but it sounds good. It's wrong. It doesn't cut taxes. It doesn't slow down the growth in property taxes. It doesn't fix anything. And they know that. You, know, you said a little bit earlier that this will slow down some of the development. You said good. Uh, is, is that the goal here is to stop some of this explosive growth that we have seen, especially in the Treasure Valley, but also in places like Twin Falls? They have said that it, they will slow down the growing, not a growth, not us. I don't think it will because I don't think they can do that. If they could, they should be doing it now because some of these places are out of control. But the city's new, their new uh, one-liner is if you pass this, we're not going to let any more houses be built, say, in Star. Well, there's a lot of people in Star probably would like that. But let me tell you what the truth is. If that bill passes, it's not going to slow down the growth in Star. It's not going to slow down the growth in Twin Falls. It's not going to slow down the, the growth in Idaho Falls or Coeur d'Alene. It's not going to do it. Or Hayden Lake or Rathrum. It's not going to slow down the growth. It's just their excuse to try to get senators to vote no. It's, it's, it's what, a blackmail maybe? I don't know what the word is. Yeah, I wanted to move on to the proposals about decentralizing the attorney general's office. Representative Blanksma, you are one of the sponsors of one of these bills. A similar one got killed in Senate Resources and Conservation earlier this week. How is this bill different? 
Well, I think both bills are very similar, and I had spoken with Senator Harris, who was the sponsor on the Senate side, about what we should do, whether we should combine or if we should just run them. And I think we're getting close enough to the transmittal date. We both just decided to let, let's get them out there so we can get moving. Um, I think the difference between mine coming out of the House and, um, and Senator Harris's coming out of his committee is that the AG dropped a decision right then, and he didn't have time to respond to it within the committee. So um, I had the advantage of getting that decision prior to the debate we had yesterday on the optional um, portion of the, the DAG bill that was presented by um, Representative Skog and, and Representative Vanderwoude. And it, the, it has a lot of inconsistencies with regard to what the Attorney General is arguing as to why they want to keep the DAGs in certain agencies. And I think that the reason that, it, that they had problems in the Senate is just they didn't have time to go through the full decision. Let's talk specifically about what your bill sure. would do. It would no longer allow the attorney general um, or deputy attorneys general to represent the Department of Lands. Why is that a concern? Well, it, it, for those of those folks who don't understand how it works, there's the Board of Lands, right, that has a constitutional the land board that that has the constitutional officers on it one of which is the Attorney General. Then there's the Department of Lands that does the management component uh, of what we're doing with state lands, and their job is to fund the endowment, you know, make, make good choices, essentially, make money for the state of Idaho. So there, there needs to be a bright line between the two. Now, that doesn't mean that any of the authority of the Attorney General goes away. He, is, he still maintains his spot on the board. He can still make decisions on the board. He can still have opinions on the board. He can still make recommendations on the board. The point is that the Department of Lands that's doing the management should have independent counsel because otherwise what he's done is put his employees into the Department of Lands and no other constitutional officer is able to put their employees into the Department of Lands to give advice. And so essentially it's two bites at the apple. So you have employees of the Attorney General giving advice to the Department of Lands based upon advice of the Attorney General who sits on the board that then makes the decisions. And so after several incidences, and it comes from, you hate to point at specifics because the department is a regulatory body and you don't necessarily want any sort of punishment for some of these groups that are frustrated with certain conditions, but you want them to have independent legal advice so that they're, they're really working for the agency. And that was one of the arguments that came up in the middle of committee. Well, they, th these um, deputy attorney generals need to be embedded in land so they don't disagree with the attorney general, and I would argue that's exactly the problem that we have, because we need attorneys that are dedicated to the Department of Lands giving the best advice there. So I also believe that some of the figures that it have been ridiculously inflated by the Attorney General um, in an effort to scare people as far as what it would actually cost um, to provide that kind of legal advice. And I would also point out a lot of what they're looking for in the Department of Lands as far as legal advice are relatively simple transactions. Now sometimes there's big stuff, but a lot of stuff is lease maintenance or mining claim maintenance, that type of thing. Okay, let's talk. You, you mentioned uh, figures that people mm -hmm. brought up as a concern. We're talking specifically about what it would cost to for an agency to hire a private attorney as opposed to using the state centralized deputy attorneys general system. Mm -hmm. um, so, how how do you get to the figure that th this is not going to be as expensive as opponents said that it is going to be because. I've, I've heard multiple numbers here about oh, yeah. how expensive and how, how affordable the attorney general is. Where's the disparity? Well, I think there's a lot of disparity and then there's some numbers and those were billable hour numbers that were thrown out by the minority leader the other day. That's not actually what the attorney general charges when he does outside work. So what we did, because we, we were trying to be as equitable we, as we could and use real numbers, $250 an hour is the number that the AG charges outside agencies for work. Now I would remind you also, thanks to you, the taxpayer, mm -hmm who pays the overhead on the attorney general's office, they can decrease their fees because of the taxpayer dollars that are paying for the offices, the papers, the pens, that kind of overhead. So I think that when we talk about removing 
the three dedicated um, deputy AGs to the Department of Lands, which is just over $360,000, which we could then subtract from the Attorney General's budget, then we're looking at just having targeted legal advice rather than somebody sitting in the office full time collecting benefits, collecting insurance, and instead you can contract out on an as needed basis. The other important thing to remember about um, this kind of legal advice is that um, the legislature sets the budget, right? We have two constitutional responsibilities. One is to review the rules, as Representative Moyle is well aware of, House Bill 100. And then the other uh, opportunity that we have is to set the budget. And so that what I think is really important is we're appropriating the taxpayer dollars. We can decide what we think the limits should be on what legal advice should cost. And I think also within that, you know, we've all heard about trailer bills, anybody who follows along or, or excuse me, supplementals. And so if they go over what was appropriated, then they have the opportunity to ask for a supplemental. All of those create checks and balances to cost. Whereas right now there is no check and balance. The, the attorney general just asked for a, an additional deputy. So we've gone from right around, I believe, it, it, we've gone since I think it was 1990, and I don't have my sheet in front of me, from having about 80 deputy attorney generals. Now we're at 120. So you tell me where we're saving money in this consolidation. We've just continued to add. So <laughs> that I, I think those are some points that might have been left out in, in the attorney general's opinion. Uh, Representative Moyle, I wanted to bring you back into the conversation. There are two proposals that are still in front of the legislature now. One, uh, that Representative Blanksma is is sponsoring um, that is specific to the Department of Lands and then one that would allow all state agencies to choose to hire outside counsel. Mm -hmm. You supported this when it was in front of the House on um, Wednesday. And I, I wanted to ask you about that. You've been at the legislature uh, a long time. Mm -hmm. And as you know, this is far from the first time this has come up. I've spoken to former Attorney General David Leroy about this a few times over the years, and he called Idaho's central centralized AG system the gold standard. Why change it now? Because it's not working. It doesn't work. And, and you've already got other agencies that are getting out. Uh, I think Public Utilities hires their own. Board of Tax Appeals hires their own. They're all looking for their own attorneys because, quite frankly, they usually do better. Look at the legislature. Now that we've started hiring outside counsel, we seem to start winning these lawsuits that we never won in the past. And there's a perception with some within the legislature that, that maybe there's some things going on that shouldn't be going on, like the attorney general doing stipulated agreements that basically create law around the legislature, or the fact that it seems to us, some of us anyways, that a lot of times he's doing nothing more than the bidding of the executive branch. He should be neutral. So there's a lot of other issues that tie into this. This has been around for a long time. But I think with some of the actions that have happened this, this last year that I'll stay out of, that I think people have said it's time to maybe fix this a little bit and get it where that those agencies have the chance to hire their own, their own people. Think about tax to commission. They have attorneys there that represent the poor taxpayer when he gets audited, and it's the same attorney that's supposed to be representing him when they're going through appeals. It doesn't make sense. There should be a separation there. And it's the same with some of the other places he's at. So I think this bill, both of them are important, and I hope that we can get them passed so that the agencies can make the right decisions, so that the agencies can protect the, the citizens of Idaho and so that we have some neutrality versus this one-sided, because there's always that little bit of favoritism one way or the other and we need to have our own attorneys representing us so they favor us the way we want to be represented in my opinion so i have to say i can think of uh, a few times that attorney general wasden has made that executive branch pretty unhappy with some of his opinions uh you know speaking of Not people very often. Who, no <laughs> <laughs> we'll ask governor otter about that um you know Speaking of people who are unhappy, I get the impression that some members of your own caucus are unhappy that their bills are not getting hearings. They've forced the readings of bills from the House chief clerk. Um, you know, as majority leader and House caucus chair, how do you two approach those conversations? So how are the feelings among caucus members right now, uh, Representative Blanksma? Well, I, I think it's important to remember that this um, chairman deciding what to hear is not an unusual process. This is done throughout the United States. 
the chairman are in charge of their own agenda. This whole idea that every bill gets a hearing is a little bit manufactured in that, that it's just, this is part of the process, has been part of the process traditionally, and is not unusual throughout the United States. Not everything gets a hearing. And because you have to remember, for a bill to get a hearing, it costs time, money, effort. And so you have to be respectful of that. And you want bills that are having hearings to be seriously considered and not just considered things um, for um, a, a personal agenda. I think that's really important to remember. I think that um, we're doing our best to try to work with caucus members and try to set a path forward so that if they do have things that want to be considered seriously by the entire House, there's, there's some steps that you have to go through and some boxes you, you need to check just for your own, um, your own peace of mind, knowing that you're going to create a, a piece of legislation that's going to go forward with some purpose. And so I think we've all been, I know the, the majority leader has been, I know I've been working with some of our members that are interested in bringing legislation forth that may have had a little bit of a rocky road to give them a couple of paths forward and help them check the trap lines so that they have a greater degree of success in doing that. You know, I, I know that a lot of people at home are thinking, for heaven's sake, why not just hear these bills, especially ones that seem to have a lot of support among your caucus members and, and honestly among Democrats, too. I'm thinking especially about the grocery tax repeal, uh, Representative Moyle's favorite proposal over the years, I know. Um, Brought the first why, one myself. <laughs> <laughs> so why not let it have a hearing? It's not me that's stopping it from having a hearing. The other thing you got to bifurcate too when we talk about bills is sometimes individual legislators, instead of going through the committee process, will try to go around the committee process with personal bills. And that has been a no-no since I can remember. Those bills and speakers in days gone past have always thrown those in ways and means because it's a way around the committee process. But even when we talk about the chairman, they do have the, the latitude to do that. I think there's a perception among some that leadership goes in there and tells them what to do. Not so much on the House. Maybe that happens no. on the Senate, but it uh, doesn't happen on the House. And so those, those chairmen, with that chairmanship, have some power and authority, and they have those, the, the ability to do the, that if they choose. I do know that, that usually the chairman will work with them and try to find solutions and paths forward. But sometimes we, um, like anywhere else, sometimes people get mad and angry, and, and that doesn't help move their bill along. And when they threaten people or do some of the things that have gone on that we used to never see, it makes it even tougher because then you have chairmen that bow their back and say, no way. And so we've got to be careful how we handle it, that we don't do that and work together and it'll work better. But, but most of them, I think, like Megan said, they're working through the process. Most of them, we're trying to help them find a solution and, and we'll get there. Well, we'll and, get there. It takes time. and to piggyback a little bit off of what Representative Moyle was saying, um, this is a collaborative process, right? There are 105 legislators that you have to get a majority of them to come along with you. And so you just do yourself more of a favor if you work in a collaborative way. And, and that's what our chairman are trying to encourage, is to make sure that folks who want to have hearings on their bill will have success. That, that's the point of the whole thing, is we want people to be successful. One of the other One things too that we ought to talk about is the fact sometimes people get in the press and say their bill does one thing, but it really does another. And the chairman, because he gets to see those RSs, knows what it really says. And that's been really frustrating the last couple of years because we can go throw the propaganda out there, but just because we, just because somebody says it says something doesn't mean it does. And a prime example is that property tax relief bill on the Senate. Their concerns are not necessarily truthful. And so when we start playing that game, it makes it harder for the chairman. They'll start, they, they push back, which, which is their prerogative. One last question before I let you two go. What's going to be the going home issue? Representative Moyle, I'll start with you. Uh, it's going to be pro it's going to be taxes. It's going to be budgets. It's going to be roads. And then the fourth thing is going to be what's this new money from the federal, this, this new monopoly money, the funny money that the federal government's going to send. Those will be the four issues, I think. Yeah, I don't blink spot. I don't know that I have too much to add to that. I think probably the biggest thing on our plate is this huge surplus that we've got in trying to figure out a way, the, the most efficient way to return it to taxpayers, be it via roads, be it via rebates. We, that, I think that's our biggest issue right now. We have this enormous surplus because you know Idahoans did what Idahoans do. We, we stuck it out and we spent locally and now we have this abundance that we need to return to our folks. And so I think that's, that's gonna be the major focus to get us out of here this year. 
House Majority Leader Mike Moyle, House Majority Caucus Chair Megan Blinksma, thank you both so much for joining us. Thank, thank you. Thank you. It was good to see you.